All right, let's go ahead and get started this morning uh, with Grand Rounds. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dan uh, Rosenthal is our guest speaker this morning. And uh, we had planned on Dr. Ramos introducing him. He begged me, but he's caught in traffic. Um, instead of telling me his whole story, Dr. Uh, Rosenthal is going to go ahead and introduce himself. Uh, he's here because he got passed over for Pope. He said that he was too young. All right, Dan, Dr. Rosenthal. Thank you, and thank you for coming and listening to my story about hernias. Uh, to introduce myself, I uh, studied medicine in Beirut, Lebanon. Years ago, before, you know, Hezbollah was uh, in command there. And then they told me, go to America for training, because over there they have good training and the streets are paved with gold. I went to New York, no gold. Newark, New Jersey, no gold. Well, I've never been to Omaha, so I don't know, but I don't know that Omaha has gold. Came here, trained in surgery in New York City, trained at the Leahy Clinic in colorectal surgery. Uh, came back to New York, started working, and then I got a big piece of paper that says that the President of the United States putting great trust and confidence in your honesty and blah, 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 blah. And I wonder, you know, how come Eisenhower knows me, you know, from where? And they told me, you idiot, that means you have to go in the Army. And this is why I went in the Army. I liked it in the Army. I spent an obscene amount of time in the Army, I retired, I went into private practice here in San Antonio, had a great time. But after a while, I said, you know, I don't want to live by my beeper. And I left private practice after 12 years and went to work for something called Uniform Service University, which is a military medical school uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. After going up there, they told me, Dan, why don't you stay in San Antonio at Brook Medical Center because you're going to send a lot of students there and in surgery and you stay there. So I have been there since uh, 2000. And I'm uh, going to be uh, there again, uh, I don't know for how long, but I'm retiring from, for a full, a full, uh, for, from professorship, stuff like this, and become like a lot of gentlemen in here, emeritus. That's how you say it? emeritus or emeritus, yeah, something like this, starting in July. So today, I want to tell you a story about hernias. I was always fascinated by hernias. I did hernias. And one of the great thing about being old, the very rare thing, is that you've seen things that a lot of people have not seen. For instance, when you go and ask for suture while you repair a hernia, they have available here kangaroo tendons made by Ethicon. Kangaroo tendon. Kangaroo tendons was the answer to chromic cut gut because when the hernias were originally made, you know, especially by Dr. Marcy in Boston, he said chromic cat gut is the material to use. Well, everything fell apart, obviously, after a while. So they say we're going to have to use something. Silk was really not very popular and also was kind of dangerous. They didn't know what silk does to human body. So they say we'll use biological things. That term existed. And they use kangaroo tendons. I don't know in the OR, doctor, they have still kangaroo tendons? I don't think so. Yeah, me neither. I don't think so. But this is, I'm sorry, this is one of the advantages of, of having a few years. Well, to start with, a little preamble. Nowadays, even a third-rate resident, even though this thing doesn't exist anymore, you know, can do a great hernia and get a great success. Why? Because of mesh, because of the Lixus plan repair, because of laparoscopic, the use of mesh. With the mesh, you fix everything. Well, and this is why today the results are excellent. And also, nowadays when you say we had a good result, it doesn't mean that you waited five years and there was no recurrence. Well, everybody can get that. The problem is that you do not get pain. Because nowadays, especially when you use laparoscopic techniques and you use staples or screws or even glue in the back and stuff like this, pain still remains a problem. And today the success is measured 
by the lack of pain after a successful herniography repair. Who are those guys? These are San Cosmas and San Damian, patron saints of surgeons. We should know that, anybody who is in surgery, just in case you know who to talk to. There's a wonderful story about Cosmos and Damien, but this is a matter of another talk. We don't see many of those nowadays because people are operated and it's an easy, op relatively easy operation to do, etc. But in the past, I remember seeing a lot of those, especially in the old country, because of inability of care. And as you know, hernia left to themselves, especially if they occur young, grow like pregnancy. And one of the problem is in those people and throughout antiquity, when you have a hernia like this, it is difficult to work hard in the fields. It's difficult to go and work manually, you know. It's, first of all, nobody will take you in the army. And also, you cannot even enter the church when you have this. And this goes back to the good old days where you can read in the Bible, and if anybody here still reads the Bible, in Leviticus 21, there is a stigma on harboring hernia or having damaged testicles. Those people could not go to the temple, could not be a Levite, could not be people officiating. And if the ones of you who know well Hebrew can read up, and they found written that air in the sack. They didn't know what it was. They thought it was air in the sack. Now, the word hernia, as you can see here, comes from the Greek that means a sprout. And the person, apparently, who uh, introduced the word was the great Aristotle, who had a friend who he called a sprout. If you want to do surgery nowadays, you need three things. And the subject of my talk today is to show you who are the people and how this, all this came together. If you go in Germany along the Bodensee, the, the Boden uh, Lake, there's a beautiful town called Lindau. In this particular town, there is a museum. And the museum, which is called the Gaspar Stromaya, uh, museum is copies of, they don't have the original unfortunately, but they have r r copies of the document a certain Gaspar Stromayer wrote in the 16th century in a big book called Practica Copiosa that is first half is hernia, second half is ophthalmology. You can buy reproductions for a few two to three hundred dollars and it's worthwhile having. Now what does this thing contain hernia wise? Well, it contains magnificent illustrations, magnificent illustrations. And first of all, this was the classic attempts at reduction. All of you know when a hernia comes in and it is incarcerated, you put the patient, you relax him, you uh, rub his belly gently, then you bend his, etc., etc. So attempt at reduction was known in those days. But if things really don't work and the reduction cannot be done, then you have to do something beyond. First of all, you put the patient in a nice hot tub and you let him here rest. And also you feed him good. That NPO after midnight is nonsense, especially in those days. They didn't know what it means. So they fed the patient well the day before, so he has strength to support the operation. In the morning, the surgeon and his assistant look at the various instruments, and then they proceed. But it's probably the most important part of the operation, the communal prayer, hoping that the good Lord intervene, save the patient, save his family, and most important, save the surgeon. And then, they put the patient on a table in an incline, and they start operating. They have to tie him well. Uh, there is a book of, called Great Operation of Surgery by Dr. Bell, the man of the Bell palsy, etc. was a surgeon uh, in the days of Napoleon, etc., etc. 
and his great operation for surgery, he describes the operation for the strangulated and, or in, and incarcerated hernia, in which he recommends to go in the house of the patient the day before and look for a solid table. After that, you take the table and you place the table in the room that has the best light in the morning. Then you go to the marketplace and look for two stout, robust, young, you know, men, generally butcher's aid, you see, and you tell them to bring with you two big sacks of sawdust. And you throw the sawdust, because after the operation was going on for 10, 15 minutes, you had on the floor dust, vomiting, sweat, and blood, and God knows what, and this would help. So maybe those guys had that stuff over there. And then essentially what they did was a castration. They removed the testicle, pushed the hernia, etc. Now, you see those two guys in the back, the dog and the magpie. Well, the dog didn't feed him for a couple of days. And then after the testicle was removed, it was dropped and quickly disappeared. And therefore, there was no proof that castration took place. Once this was done, this thing was drains or placed. Drains in reality was a whole bunch of threads that were put from the incision out through a hole in the scrotum because superation would take place for sure. I didn't want that thing to run out. I didn't want it to stay down there. And then after that, they put a big, big dressing and there was a man there with an hourglass, you can see, showing that, you know, really they did a good job in good time. And then the surgeon gently walked the patient to his bed and the surgeon left town. Because when the patient comes up and the dressing comes up, the man realizes that now he's uno and he may be very upset. Ambroise Paré, a French surgeon who is one of my heroes because he served five French kings and spent most of his surgical life on the battlefield. And he is the man who first realized that when you have bleeding, you don't put a hot iron to it, but you try to clamp the vessel or use compression and clamping rather than burning. Ambroise Barry realized that all attempts at curing hernias are futile, and he was one of the surgeon who popularized all kinds of belts to hold hernias in place with Franco and others, and this is why he's famous when it comes to hernia. As you can see, even nowadays, a lot of people say, surgery, are you kidding me? I'm sure there is an alternative to this, and they like to wear those hernia devices to hold their intestines in. And now, some of the men who help us get the first leg of the tripod there, anatomy. And this is Gabriele Fallopio, 16th century, and he described what the French call pupar ligament, what we call nowadays the inguinal ligament, but it was first described by Fallopio. It goes from the, you know, that's anterior spine to the pubic tubercle. This is Antonio Gimbernat y Arbos, a gentleman from Spain, who described the lacunar ligament, also called Gimbernat ligament. It is right here, right here. And for those who know anatomy, I'm sure all the residents know this by heart, that this ligament of Gimbernat forms the medial, the medial aspect of the femoral canal. Because after Gimbernat, right here, you have a vein, an artery, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So Gimbernat ligament is important. Next is Sir Astley Paston Cooper. Sir Astley Paston Cooper was not born Sir. He became Sir when he removed a sebaceous cyst from the scalp of George IV, who was very impressed and didn't bleed to death or died, and he made him a Sir, a baronet. 
he described and is known today for that black thing here, Cooper's ligament. Now, I always wondered when I was younger, thank you God for putting Cooper's ligament there, it's solid, and this allows us to do better hernia repairs. When in fact somebody told me later on, no Dan, this is simply the very strong aponeurosis of origin of the pectineus muscle, no more, no less, because this lies right on the pectineal crest down there. So, so much for Cooper's ligament. But he was a famous surgeon and he wrote, and he wrote an excellent treatise on, I'll show it to the residents later on maybe today, on the anatomy and the surgery of abdominal hernia. And you see that people did not go to him or other surgeons in those days with a teensy weensy little hernia to be fixed, but those men carried a hernia that generally went down to the mid thigh and demanded to be cured. This is what Cooper said, and I go along with this. Antonio Scarpa is the man who, again, described the inguinal canal and also described his famous triangle. This famous triangle is known mostly for the vascular surgeon because right in there you have all the good stuff that vascular surgeons love, the common femoral, uh, the deep femoral, and then the superficial femoral, the vein, the saphenous, and you can see here the triangle, which is, you know, the inguinal ligament and the, uh, one of the adductors and the sartorius. That's the famous triangle of Scarpa. By 1830, 1840, we had anatomy. We knew anatomy of the groin pretty, pretty well. And now we were going to the second leg. And this was anesthesia, the greatest invention that medicine ever, ever, ever made. For anybody here who ever had surgery or a tooth removed or anything done, you know that anesthesia is it. I don't care what instrument they use, they do the anterior approach, laparoscopic approach, but I want that white thing to drip into my veins. It's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Anesthesia. To the glory of the dentist, it is dentists that introduce anesthesia, eater and chloroform. And in 1846 at the Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. Warren gave an as operated and Dr. Norton gave anesthesia. Everybody stood there and the lady had a tumor in the maxilla and when they made the cut, all the students and everybody grabbed the railing, you know, for the great scream, none came. He did the operation without a noise, without a sound, and at the end, Dr. Warren turned to the audience and told them, gentlemen, this is no bunk. In those days, this was the paper, the, the journal, like New England Journal of Medicine today, that canonized techniques and substances and medicine and stuff like this. So this is the precursor of New England Journal of Medicine, and they had this particular article, you know, in November telling that there is something indeed that works very, very well if you want to operate people. So we had the second leg, anatomy and anesthesia. And this was very, very, very dangerous because knowing anatomy and putting the patient to sleep encouraged the surgeons to go and do bigger surgery with a disaster you can imagine. One of the best examples is that during the Civil War, the surgeons had chloroform and had ether, but they kept the sutures that they used to tie the vessel under their collar of their coats so they can pull it out, you see, easier than don't lose them, you see. 
And then once the amputation was done, they would take the saw, go like this, you know, wipe the blood and go again. Needless to say, this was not conducive to good uh, results. So we had to wait for those two men. Stir, a Frenchman, and Joseph Lister, a Scotsman in Glasgow, who having heard of Pasteur's work, decided that he wants to get rid of those little bugs that cause all those problems, and started either boiling or covering all the instrument that he's going to use with carbolic acid. The rest is history. We now had the three legs of the stool, and you could start repair hernias. Dr. Marcy was an American from Boston, and he went and visited Glasgow, was absolutely convinced of the truth in aseptic surgery, came back, and was interested by hernia, and he was one of the first to notice and to realize that to have a hernia in the groin, fascia transversalis must be breached, whether it is an inguinal hernia or a femoral hernia. The fascia transversalis has to be breached. Then you get the hernia. So he worked mostly on the fascia transversalis to try to repair the defect. And there is something called a Marcy repair, you're all familiar with, that consists of suturing the fascia transversalis on or about the, the internal ring, etc. But this did not make for good repairs. And we come to one of the great names, Eduardo Bassini. Eduardo Bassini was born in Pavia, went to medical school. He lived in an area where Italian independence was taking place, and he joined and he joined Garibaldi and his troops to fight the Austrian. He was bayoneted in the groin and developed a fecal fistula. And he was taken care in Padova by Professor Porta until it healed. Nobody really knew what he had, but probably, you know, he was lucky made a hole in the cecum and got a fecal fistula. But he got interested in the groin. And then later on, having dissected and stuff like this, and having come to America and visited with Marcy, and visited with Lister too, he also agreed that the integrity of the fascia transversalis is essential. But the point that he made is, if the fascia transversalis is not a layer one, can count on what can we use. And what he did was taking a muscular aponeurotic fascial curtain. In other words, he used to take the external oblique, I'm sorry, the internal oblique, the transversus muscle, whatever little aponeurosis there was there, and then use also the cut edge of the fascia transversalis, and brought this down as a curtain. But fix it to what? Well, the inguinal ligament, what else? From Bassini on, almost 70, 80 years, surgeon worked on that theme, changing exactly what exactly would constitute the curtain, uh, what constitute exactly the anchoring area, and therefore you have all those variations, the hosted one, the hosted two, the Lucas, et cetera, et cetera, but they are all variation on this particular team. This is from the original drawings contained in the book that Bassini published in Germany, which is almost impossible to find nowadays. And you can see here that once the fascia transversalis is exposed, the cord being pushed inferiorly, this is the sac that is held up. 
he put a groove director behind the fascia transversalis and cut it. So now you have two flaps, and he used the superior flap to bring down that famous curtain and attach it to the inguinal ligament, leaving the cord on top, and then closing the external oblique. This was the original Bassini operation. The triple layer, the triple layer, here it is, the triple layer, down to the inguinal ligament. Treihaupt in Germany. Bassini died, and this is what he left in his will. A good man, beloved by the Italian. George Lotheson. George Lotheson passed history. Why? Because one day, as he was doing a femoral hernia, he realized that he cannot reduce the sac. And the sac, as you know now, has the lacunar ligament medially, the vein laterally, underneath you have the pectineal a bone, so what can you cut? The only thing you can cut is the inguinal ligament. And this is what George Lotheson did. This was not the very first time that it was done. Other people did it, and I'll tell you a few words about this, but he popularized this. But once, once, once the inguinal ligament is cut, you cannot repair the inguinal ligament. And the only thing you had to use then is to bring that curtain to something else. And he brought it essentially to Cooper's ligament. Now, let's go to the latter day innovators, the man who really made hernia surgery what it is today. Shouldas Hospital, Shouldas Clinic, close to Toronto, Canada, great place to go and visit. I was there one day watching them doing magnificent work and by 9.15, they had done already three inguinal hernias. And they were finishing. It's all done under local anesthesia. A nurse came in and said a couple of words in my ear. I didn't know what she said. Excuse me? She said, light or dark? <laughs> she asked again, light or dark? So I turned to the surgeon, Dr. Obney, and said, Dr. Obney, light or dark? What do you mean? See, the toast, the toast, because we're going to have now tea and toast. <laughs> this is class. Nobody in San Antonio ever came to me after an operation and said, light or dark, doctor? <laughs> you should start this here. <laughs> Put some class in an otherwise, you know, already classy place. Edward Earl Shouldice was a surgeon. When World War II came, he was already a senior surgeon, and he did not join the forces. And he stayed back. He stayed back. He was a family practitioner. But family practitioner in those days did hysterectomy, hernia, gallbladder, and stuff like this. <laughs> so he went to Toronto General Hospital and started doing hernias, a lot of hernias. All the hernias came into his hand. And he also liked to use silk. So one day he asked the people, okay, be sure I have enough silk to do the next few hernias. They told him, sir, we don't have silk anymore. All the silk is used for making parachutes and stuff like that. He said, what do you have? So, well, the only thing we have is bobbins and bobbins and bobbins of wire. What wire? He says, well, we have some 22, uh, two, I'm sorry, 28, 26 stainless steel minifo wire for hernia. To make a long story short, for the last 40 years, this is what they did at the shoulders clinic. They don't use wire anymore, not proline, but they use stainless steel wire. Those people, you should see them use wire as if you would use silk. It was truly amazing, but unfortunately somebody got pricked in his finger and almost died of hepatitis, so they changed to something else. The clinic grew, and I tell you, if you ever want to see hernia repairs, go in. What, what did they do over there? What did they do? They do a bassini very well, very, very well. Essentially what they do first, they go in, once they expose the cord, the, they skeletonize the cord, they remove the cremaster, 
laterally, posteriorly, just leaving the elements of the cord. Take care of the sac, and once this is done, they open the fascia transversalis. And what you see behind right there is the preperitoneal fat. So now you have there the fascia transversalis, and the, after that you have the transverse abdominis, the transversalis fascia, I'm sorry, the, 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 the internal oblique, and then outside the external oblique. So what did they do? Starting here, medially, they imbricated every layer, and therefore you have two suture lines for each one. So for the fascia transversalis, two, for the curtain, you know, it two, and also for the external oblique. So you have, you have six lines of wire. They do this, they did this, well, I don't know, having, very fast, very well. This under local anesthesia, it would take them maybe half an hour to do the case. It was truly a, a magnificent thing to look at. And I was, I, I, I liked that thing, and I went back and I started doing it, but I didn't like to do that double thing. So my resident said, okay, let's do a rosen dice, you know, which is just one layer, you know, no, no, no imbrication. So you have only three layers, not six. That's another big name, Chester Bidwell McVeigh. Chester Bidwell McVeigh, when he was a medical student at Northwestern, spent a lot of time in doctor, uh, in the Department of Anatomy, uh, Dr. Anson, and they were very interested with the groin at that time, and they did a lot of things. And Dr. McVeigh wrote a paper once saying that the fascia transversalis, the key layer in the groin, that if breach gives you the hernia, etc., does not end on the inguinal ligament, but ends on Cooper's ligament medially, and then covers the vessel, and is called the femoral sheath. Then it covers the psoas, and it's the psoas sheath. This is how this particular fascia transversalis ends. And therefore, to suture that famous curtain to the inguinal ligament is a fundamental mistake. And he wrote an article that says a fundamental mistake in the repair of inguinal hernia. And that particular article was a sensational article because everybody went to the inguinal ligament for one very good reason. It's easy, it's right there, it's looking at you. But he said, no, it's wrong. If you want to repair in the plane where the hernias occur, you have to go down to Cooper's ligament. And you can see here where he put his sutures and then transitioned and went and sutured to the femoral sheet and then to the psoas fascia. If people to make it easier, transition and go to the inguinal ligament, you're not doing a McVeigh, you're doing a Mac Samba, somebody else. These are some of the surgeon. This is George Lothison, but other who had to use Cooper's ligament during the herniography. But Dr. Chester McVeigh said that's the way to do it. But it soon became apparent that when you bring the curtain down to Cooper's ligament, it creates a lot of tension, and therefore the famous cut was made here, sometimes called a tanner slide, allowed this thing to move, the curtain to move much easier to the Cooper's ligament, etc. Now you can do that also for Abbasidi, great. Few people know this man. His name is Henri Fruchot. He served in World War I in the French Army, served in World War II in the French Army. He joined the Gaulle early, was a military surgeon. He wrote extensively on the need, whatever a man is wounded in the battlefield, to operate on him as soon as possible. Don't spend hours transporting him, etc. He will die. So he was one of the pioneers of early operation. But he remained essentially the man 
who wrote this sensational book that if you go in herniologist meetings is considered a can and a canon the, 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 the fifth gospel or something like this what did he say he said that there is in the groin a myopectineal hole in other words from the pectineal line, which is here, turning up here, and going all around, there is a hole here. There is no muscle that covers this. There is no muscles. You only have fascia transversalis. Now, those muscles can go down, up, down, and depending, you know, the anatomy, but this is it. There is a hole, the myopectineal hole. And the job of the man who repair a hernia is to cover that myopectineal hole. Now, if you do a bassini, that's okay, but you kind of close half of it. The part below the inguinal ligament is left untouched. So in his operation of inguinal hernia, he operated and brought a curtain with a relaxing incision down to the pectinate ligament, to, 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 to the Cooper's ligament, very much like Dr. McVeigh did, but he introduced this particular idea, the myopectineal orifice. Very important. And then came Francis Usher. Everybody who does a hernia today, before doing it, says, oh, great Usher, look upon me and help me today, for you have brought us, you know, the answer, and you have brought us the light. Hail thee, O Usher. Dr. Usher lived in Houston, Texas, and he had read that particular paper by French people who in 1948 wrote Cure des éventrations par plaque de nylon, means cure of eventration or hernias using nylon. What the heck is that? Nylon. They know about stockings, but that's about it. So Dr. Usher went to the Philip Petroleum Company in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and told them, I understand you guys made something called nylon. He said, yeah, we make nylon, we make that, we make this. He said, is this, can we use this? You know, <laughs> try it. So, you know, rabbits and mice and how many pigs and dogs died, nobody knows. But Dr. Usher proved conclusively that if you take that material, which is originally polyethylene and then went to polypropylene and put it in the human body, the human body will not reject it, will take it, will incorporate it, will get a reaction around it, and will close whatever hole. I remember that in the early 60s, when some very young attendings came and says, we're going to have to use Marlex mesh. The older attendings went like this, behind me Satan, you know. You put a foreign body in, the patient will die, he'll develop alopecia, and he will, you know, lose his testicle. God knows what will happen. This will never use foreign material. Because, you'll see in a second, until Dr. Usher, this is what they used to use. Tantalum mesh, silver filigree, uh, stainless steel mesh, uh, kangaroo tendons, or autologous, you have to make more incision on somebody to take some of this stuff, you know, and put it in. All of those fell apart. All of those fell apart. Caused bad reaction. And therefore, they were all abandoned, and people were wondering, what in the world are we going to use? But with Dr. Usher, Marlex, this was the answer. The rest is history. Nowadays, no adult male hernia is repaired without mesh, with some rare exceptions. Female really don't need it. Pediatrics don't need it. But adult males need mesh. Arnold K. Henry. Arnold K. Henry is an Irishman, professor, who went to Cairo, Egypt as a professor, 
And in Cairo, Egypt, he did a lot of preperitoneal cystotomies to remove large stone in the, gold, in the, in the bladder due to schistoma that is you know, prevalent in Egypt. And one day he said, you know, whenever I approach the bladder that way, there is an unparalleled view of the groin. You could see the vessel going in. You could see the sperm, uh, the, 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 the vas deferens getting in there, the vessel getting out there. He said, you know, if I have a hernia ever, I want it to be repaired in that fashion. And for a while, this was done because this is the view from behind, you know, and this is where the action is. And essentially, under the stewardship of Dr. Stoppa and Reeves in Paris, the story was that if this is the abdominal wall and this is the peritoneum, if you put a sheet of, fascia trans of, of, uh, of mesh right here, to replace the bad fascia transversalis, this is it. The problem is solved. You will never have a hernia again because this particular mesh will not break, will not move, will not go anywhere, you see, and this is it. And in a thousand years when people are going to, the archaeologists are going to dig up all those skeletons, they will wonder who were those men who had that plastic thing in the thing. Probably either priests or warriors, who knows? Nobody will know. There will be a lot of papers on that, I'm sure. And this is how you do it. You go in, you expose the area, you clean up, you pull the peritoneum cephalad, and then you put a big piece of mesh right here. I think this thing died. You see, put a big, nice piece of mesh here through which the cord goes and the vas deferens. And this is the peritoneum. And then what do you do? You don't have to put any fixation tags or anything. Just remove the retractors. Tell the patient, the, the, the anesthesiologist, to valsalva the patient. This rolls in and hold the thing. The key is that when you do this, you have to put a big piece of mesh, which is about minimum 10 cm. This quarter has to go where the psoas is, and this quarter has to go by the bladder. If you do this and you remove the retractors, this thing will not move. But this is complicated surgery. Dr. Lichtenstein, who died in 2000, was an excellent surgeon, a civil rights leader, and he decided to put mesh anteriorly. Much easier, much, much easier. And essentially what he did, he opened and did whatever has to be done, and then he didn't have to bring no muscle down to anything. He just put a nice piece of mesh, made a hole for the cord to pass through, fixed this to the transver transversus abdominis and the uh, internal oblique, and down to the inguinal ligament, and that's the end of it. I remember going to the American College of Surgeons and seeing year after year after year Dr. Lichtenstein with a board, et cetera, explaining this to, and he sold that thing, and you know, this became almost the operation for a very long time. Variation on the theme, Dr. Gilbert from uh, Miami said, why don't we put a plug on top of this thing, you see? Because Dr. Lichtenstein, many, many years ago, had to repair hernia using just a plug. But he said, why don't you put the plug and the mesh? And this is the plug and mesh technique. A great operation, wonderful operation that gives you excellent results. And then we have laparoscopy. Laparoscopy was looking for operations to do, things to do. So they had the gallbladder. And then, you see, my God, we can do appendix. And we can do GYN surgery. And then one day we said, let's do a hernia. And in 1991-92, uh, Dr. Morris Franklin and myself worked and we decided to do it. And we did it. But in order to do it simple, we put it intraperitoneally. Patient got adhesions and didn't do too good. So the rest is history. Nowadays, a lot of hernias are done laparoscopically. 
the results are excellent. Uh, there is no limits to uh, what you can do like this. And uh, I think that probably this is the future. The laparoscopic technique was canonized in 97 by appearing in the New England Journal of Medicine. Anything that you do, if it appears in the New England Journal of Medicine, is true. And therefore, <laughs> people now said, this is it. Now, not all inguinal hernias can be done laparoscopically, as you can see. Today, the key is ambulatory surgery. Ambulatory surgery, ambulatory surgery. There is no limit at what, you know, ambulatory surgeons can do. And today, we went from the innovative uh, clinics like the Scholdeis Clinic and the, uh, the, the Liechtenstein Clinic, etc., to boutique hergography, where you go in and people suddenly are self-proclaimed hernia expert. And they have a herniology boutique, and you go there and you get your stuff done. One last word. The word is sprezzatura. Sprezzatura is an Italian word. Remember that word, sprezzatura. Sprezzatura means effortless mastery. Leonardo Paganini, Michael Jordan, effortless. I mean, try to jump like that. Meryl Streep, Lynn Hughes, try to climb on this one day and see, okay? And Dr. Cooley, sprezzatura. When it comes to hernia, this is the man who in my eyes had sprezzatura. Years and years ago, here we had something called the Gary Ratten Symposium, Surgical Symposium, Army, and it was on hernia. And I had invited Dr. Obney to come. And then one of my associates told me, you know, Dr. Rosenthal, everybody send a CV. Obney never send a CV. And I asked him twice. So I wrote a letter to Dr. Obney, which I had met, you know, when I went there. I said, Dr. Obney, we need some, please. He sent me a little letter. I said, dear Dr. Rosenthal, I did 30,000 inguinal hernias, sincerely. <laughs> when he retired, he had done 32,000. I went to see him, you know, and, you know, you talk about sprezzatura in surgery. Effortless mastery. I mean, you know, everything looked so easy, so easy. Anyone who has not watched Dr. Ramos do a rectal dissection for a low, low anterior has not seen pelvic sprezzatura. <laughs> also, for the younger people in the audience here, you reason a hernia, the man, I'm a hernia, I mean, there is not such a thing as minor surgery. Fifty years listening to M&M conference taught me that. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rosenthal. Sometime you'll have to tell us what Beirut and Lebanon was like prior. You know, it was the banking capital uh, of Europe at the time, if I remember correctly, or the Mediterranean. Were you from uh, Beirut? No, I was born in Egypt. I was born in, uh, about, I don't know, a year, no, no, what is it? Two years ago, a member of my class, Pierre Farah, who became also a surgeon, but he did it in the French system, and then became the dean of the medical school for a while, called me and told me, you know, Dan, uh, this, uh, in three months from now, it's the 50th anniversary of our graduation, and could you please come? I say, hey, I'll be delighted to come. What the heck, you know? 50-year reunion medical school is good. So a couple of months later, I get another little note. Dear Dan, due to some recent development in Beirut, I don't think it would be wise, you know, to come. <laughs> we will move this, you know, a little bit later on. You know? This is Beirut today. Good place to talk about. Yeah, well, it's good to hear the history because any of us who ever did 
make pain repair and making even making that relaxing incision. I don't think I ever walked away where I didn't feel like the repair was under tension. I mean, it was absolutely brutal. And the patients were in pain for a long period of time. You uh, know, a surgeon once adopted the lecture study center and said to me, you know, if you really want to do a hernia, really macho hernia, do the hernia on the local or the patient standing up. And then you will know what the tension is. Don't lay in a bed, give him a relaxing arm. Oh, I can't it. Come with this tongue, you can't count the angle of this. You see? And you will see what tension is. Why why work? Why work? Any questions for Dr. Rosenthal? Dr. Savu, do you have, do you try to do a laparoscopic angle hernia repair?